Policy Committee. We have uh, with us this evening councillors and officers and we will progress through our meeting uh, remotely uh, and but hopefully successfully. So we will now go to our agenda and uh, I will ask uh, Abigail, do we have any apologies for absence? Hi, good evening, Chair. We've received apologies from David Littlewood. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is our Code of Conduct and Declarations of Interest. Uh, please, could anybody who has anything to declare do so now? No declarations of interest, thank you. And please can we confirm that the minutes of the last meeting held on the 29th of January 2020 are a correct record. Uh, those who were present at the meeting, if they can um, confirm. Thank you. And now we move on to our first uh, and only main agenda item, um, which we kept as a single item because of the amount of discussion that we expect to be within this. Um, and we have the discussion about food banks, food share in our town. Our first presentation is from Tracy Williams uh, to tell us about the Warrington Food Pantry. Can I hand over to you please, Tracy? Yes, thanks Chair. Um, Warrington Food Pantry is a joint project between Warrington Borough Council, Tourist, Clarion and Warrington Food Bank. It's been supported by Warrington Voluntary Action, Sellafield and local businesses like Greencore, The Co-op, Morrisons and Asda. Those kind of places have made donations. So, so what is a food pantry? So the, the Warrington Food Pantry project is designed to enable customers to take up uh, take a step up from food banks and food shares and start accessing the food ladder using Main Street shops. So the pantry food offer is practical support, but the main aim of the pantry is to offer customers a wraparound service to improve life chances. This, you know, could be working with a customer from where they are to look at their financial and employment circumstances as well as their own health and well-being. And the idea of the pantry first emerged from the Wellform Reform, Welfare Reform Partnership, which had highlighted um, an emerging need to support people who were struggling to pay basic household bills, often choosing between food, heating the homes, are paying a bill. So <clears throat> the aim of the pantry um, as well is to support people who face life barriers um, and it's an asset based approach where we draw on the strength and potential in the community looking for volunteers or the need for it and who could run it. So we wanted to provide affordable and wholesome food and to develop a sustainable non-for-profit model and to connect to other services. So a client wasn't just coming, getting food for six months and then we wouldn't see them again because that way then we hadn't addressed anything. So we wanted to offer more of a holistic approach that touched on everything really. So um, the history of the pantry, next slide please Adam, <laughs> um, is the area was identified for the following reasons. It had a higher area of deprivation, um, 555 tenants in the area are on some sort of benefit, universal credit or housing benefit. There were 707 tenants who were of working age 
and of those, 355 are on a benefit. And as a pilot project, we had the support and partnership of the two main housing providers in the area. We had a local WBC building that could house the project. And we, was, we had a lot of feedback from the food bank of um, the kind of the area people were coming from who used it. So it was a huge indicator that there was food poverty in that area. So next slide, please. So what's the difference? So in a food share, well, in a food bank, there's 1,200 food banks in the northwest and the service provides um, food, what they get from donations to people can access it who are at crisis point and they're like an emergency food parcel. So to access them, you usually need a food voucher and referred into the survey, into the part, into the food bank. Um, so what's the food share? Well, none of us can throw away good, afford to throw away good food. And that's why stores give products that are going out of date to local community groups at the end of each day to prevent food waste. So it's estimated that over three million meals have been donated, which would have gone to landfill. So not for profit groups, non for profit groups can use this food and share with their communities. And and although the community groups do a brilliant and valuable job, we've got to be careful that we're not creating a dependency on that service, that it's the same people who are going to do Monday down at Busey, Tuesday at Longford, that kind of thing. Um, and we've got to try to avoid creating a dependency. Next slide. So partners and donators. So the Warrington Food Pantry main partners are Taurus Housing, Clarion, Warrington Food Bank, Warrington Voluntary Action and Fair Share. And there's been a management committee formed and the, uh, those groups have given financial support to buy fridges and freezers and other products we needed to set up the pantry. Um, we've also got money from Sellafield and from the SIF fund, because it was a major startup, it was quite expensive to buy the things that we needed. Because um, when we got members coming in the pantry, they'd often just use microwave meals. They didn't have a, a pan to cook on or a cooking utensil, a spoon. So for when a new member joins, every member gets a startup bag containing basic items, utensils, spices, salt and pepper, that kind of thing, some oxo cubes. Um, and they get recipe ideas. So if that week fair share have been and donated a load of mince, we would print out recipe ideas, what you can do with mince to feed a family of four. So there was different ideas. Um, so when the client comes in and you take all their information and sign them up, then we offer um, financial help benefit advice, access to other services, well-being, credit union, and it's like a holistic approach, a cup of tea, they can have a chat with other members. So that friendly chat gets people talking and gets people at ease and telling you what's going on in the lives. So that's been quite good as well. So volunteers, next slide, please. So the pantry is run by volunteers with support from the neighbourhood team. Now, getting the right quality of volunteers is important as commitment was essential for the smooth delivery of the pantry. Um, and often we had fantastic volunteers, but they couldn't commit to many hours. Um, so often staff had to stand in, which wasn't a good idea, but you know, we got through it. So training was offered at the beginning, but at the time the volunteers we had couldn't commit to it. So going forward, training will be provided by Warrington Voluntary Action, who will recruit and support at every stage. And I think that is a much better option and that was a real valuable lesson learned because I think we was too hands on as well at the beginning, whereas 
another organisation were better with volunteers than we was. Next slide, please. So the pantry opened three sessions a week, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And every Friday we'd get a delivery off Fair Share. So we paid every quarter for the stock from Fair Share and the items delivered hit and miss some weeks fantastic products and you know all members got a really good share of it other weeks there was unusual stuff you know like duck legs and um seafood prawns and mussels and to the average family what what would i do with this i don't know what to do with this so i think we'd be a bit smarter on how we did that as well maybe buy it in differently um, and the food bank often donates non-perishable items that they've got a lot of stuff like the cereals and the beans. So next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. So the pantry supports 40 members and their families at any one time. Um, they pay a weekly membership and to come, become a member, they have to live in the WA2 areas or to have been referred in by a partner from another area and um, they could have joined you know we did emergency parcels and we provided emergency support when needed so everybody gets a household benefit check and that could have been as well um, an income check to check the gas and the electric make sure they're getting fair deals because a lot of our families were still on the prepayment cards which is you know we all know is the dearest way to to use it so um a lot of them have used the toy appeal and they signed up for cookery lessons that was run in the centre and um, this lady came in one day she had a pot of money to deliver it and we got our customers to attend that so that was really good and um, some of the families have opened credit union accounts and access services offered within community centres you know like the the craft groups and um, the, the coffee mornings and chat groups. So it's opened up for them as well. Um, next slide, please. So membership lasts for six months and um, this is to prevent dependency. So for the money that they pay, they will get three days worth of food for a breakfast, dinner and tea. Sometimes it's more dependent on if we've got a um, you know, a big donation. That's roughly that picture is what they'd expect to get, and you could make a meal for three days for family out of that. Um, there's menu cards around the pantry to show people what to do and how to do it. Next slide, please. So there's different food parcels available. We catered for vegetarians, vegans, gluten intolerance, you name it, we had them all. Um, we had menus up, recipe cards and staff and volunteers are aware of dietary needs. We had to be very careful with that. So it was involved with food hygiene and um, who, who looked at what we were selling, uh, what we were well, sort of selling, I suppose, and um, what we could give away. So we had to put signs up, you know, this may have nuts in, this may not, that kind of thing. All the products are colour coded. So instead of dealing in money, you're dealing in value so the red meat and fish is a red item and um, amber cakes frozen meals fridge food and vegetables and tinned with, with green items and they could fill the basket to the value what we had in and um, we had we call them like managers specials so the, there was baby products ladies products baby chocolates um, are all optional extras and that's not counted as part of the food offer. So the last day we had the pantry open was the 17th of March last year. Um, so it's not been open since then due to COVID. But a lot of those people we helped through the safe and well. We've had online meetings to discuss best practice, lessons learned and the way forward. And the, our plans for January was to recruit new members and training the volunteers, which um, Warrington Voluntary Action have kindly done, and they would have access to recognised qualifications, which would help them, the volunteers, going forward in, in their lives. 
So, um, summing up, um, the pantry is short term to lift members out of food poverty. It empowers individuals to make informed choices. It would build confidence and um, allows access to training, jobs and volunteering. It can be a pathway into other services, learn new skills, cookery, shopping, budgeting. And that's about it. So I hope you've enjoyed that and you've got any questions, please ask. Thank you, Adam. So thank you, Chair. Sorry, my my uh, mute was on. So oh, <laughs> thank you, Tracy. And I saw that uh, Sharon had a question. So um, if, you, if you'd like to ask that question. OK, thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for your presentation, which was very interesting. I've just got a couple of questions, if that's OK. Yes. Um, what happens to people after six months? What what was the plan for them then if they weren't, if they hadn't become independent enough? And the other question, which I, I just might as well ask at the same time, is it's if the pantry's not been open since March 2020, what has been going on for people during that period of time? Thank you. OK, um, after the six month period, if people wasn't ready to move on, we would have had like a, a conversation, special meeting, and they could have been kept on a bit longer. We was never going to turn, say to anyone, you've had your six months now, go on. We was never going to do that. And the conversation would have been had, more help put in place and um, carried on for, and it's say another month, another two months, that kind of thing. But when they signed up, they knew it was six months and they knew that they would have to share their experiences and say to us, uh, why they didn't feel like they could move on. And what was the other question? Oh, what have they been doing since? Um, well, luckily, um, quite a lot of them was clients of, that we knew from that area. So some of them um, have gone on to, well, they've used the food bank when needed um, and other local, you know, the, the, the community things that have popped up, the helping hands type of thing. Um, but most of them have made big changes um, because for, for a lot of people, it had a positive experience. A lot of the younger families went on to do some training um, not you know, with up with partner agencies, especially on the Clarion estate. And they've been supporting them, the Clarion housing. Uh, there's lots of training going on over there, IT training um, and education packages. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Has anybody else got any questions for Tracy? No? Okay. Uh, I think that was an e excellent insight into what the pantry did and um, we'll, we can do in the future. And I think also there's lots of things that we could share with the food share offers the doorstep type offers um to make that a more of a, a lead into the pantry or food bank or to help people move on so i think there's a, a, a lot of work there that we can share and help things along it certainly made a lot of sense to me thank you tracy thank you chair uh, the next uh presentation if we move on is um the warrington voluntary action uh, uh, overview on the current volunteer situation from allison so if allison can uh, join us and tell us a little bit about what the current situation is that would be great Thank you, Chair. Well, I haven't got a presentation, but I will give a brief overview of volunteering in Warrington and how that could then be related to the food pantry, which we've already talked about, and supporting the food poverty agenda. So, um, since March, we had a total of um, over 1,600 volunteers that signed up with 
um, ourselves. Obviously, something fantastic coming out of a terrible pandemic, the number of people coming forward, and that just isn't the ones that came forward to WUVA. Volunteers have been active right across the town. Um, but what we did with the ones that signed up with us, we obviously took their details. That would also include if they already had a DBS, we had to find out what types of cars they had. So even those who were going out doing some of the food deliveries, what insurance they had on the car, their availability and um, skills and experience, et cetera. So that was actually quite a big task to start gathering that information because the volunteers were doing all sorts of different, different things from I've listed here some of the main things that we did over the summer um, that were related to working with the Safe and Well team. Must admit, we've worked throughout with Warrington Council and the Safe and Well, um, and that's a really good thing that came out of COVID as well. So um, just putting that out. So yeah, we had volunteers doing telephone reassurance calls um, with individuals, delivering the prescriptions. Um, Tracy mentioned it before, we had a number of volunteers on a rotor basis helping out at Fernhead Community Centre, packing the food parcels and delivering them. And unfortunately, on some occasions, going around collecting them to bring them back as well. Um, I know, um, yeah, um, nothing to do with Tracy's team at all, Chris's team. It was actually those people who were shielded and getting the free parcels from the government. So many people said, I don't actually need one, but I want to give it to somebody who does. So getting volunteers to go around collecting them to take them to um, Fernhead so they could go to people who needed them. Um, at one point we had a man with a van going around, um, a volunteer with a van. Um, but volunteers were also involved in delivering safe and well leaflets. Um, 81, surprising to me, signed up to drive med paramedics around for the CCG because um, at, at one point they were going to do testing at the door stops um, and yeah, so the, the volunteers, we needed to check out what type of car they had. They had to have a five door car um, and the number of people coming forward who had small cars, a Fiat 500, like, no, sorry, you can't do it. Uh, but people just really wanted to help out. Um, and then we also had eight volunteers that we trained up to be town centre ambassadors. So when the town opened back up, they were going to help with the um, helping people to follow the signage, etc. So they're still on board as well. So from this year, we still have 1,630 volunteers on our database. We do send them out regular information. We do tell them things that are going on, not just with ourselves, with the local authority, but also with other um, community and voluntary organisations to see where they want to join. Just to keep that momentum going, really, because this is the first time we've had in Warrington just such a large bank of volunteers who want to help out and help out in the community but more on an ad hoc basis rather than a I do every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning. It's sort of just call on me if you need me. Um, so we've currently got, well, the number's just gone up since since we did this, 102 volunteers supporting with the marshalling for the COVID um, vaccinations. So they're off Jubilee Hub and the Halliwell Jones. We've got another group going to start at the Islamic Centre um, as from next week. And this week we have a number of volunteers being trained up to do the um, lateral flow testing as well. So when that widens up into some other areas, maybe volunteers can help out because actually the local authority can't keep staffing people to be doing absolutely everything. So where volunteers can help out, um, who want to help out as well, we may as well engage um, with them. We do and have done all the way through um, the pandemic and still do coordinate um, volunteers for the food bank on a rotor basis. So I think this is where we know having volunteers on the rotor does work. So we coordinate um, 26 volunteers for the food bank um, for their rotor. So they've got their own volunteers, but because they're every every time we get, um, when we're in tier four or when it's the lockdowns, they've got an increase in deliveries. So uh, we help out with that. And um, as I said at the very beginning, just before the meeting myself and Tracy were talking about it, we still have oh, it's 32 people who are waiting to start at the food pantry and ready to get going when it opens, um, which is good. And if any of them move on, I don't think we need to worry that there isn't going to be people to fill their spaces. Um, volunteering really is, people just want to help out and volunteer. 
And um, we also um, now run a Good Neighbours project providing low level support. So there's 72 volunteers signed up for that. So they're doing shopping, prescriptions, home visit check ins. So we've had a number of those where a family member may live in doesn't live in Warrington and is actually really worried about mum. So we've had a volunteer just knock on the window, check if everything's OK and then got back in touch with us. And we've either shared that information with the family or the safe and well service because sometimes elderly people are at home and don't really want to mind the family members and they're saying, yeah, I'm fine, you know, but the family's a little bit worried about them. So we're doing the um, home visits as well for the volunteers just to sort of do that knock on the window, etc. Um, so I think there's real opportunities for, for volunteers to be involved in food pantry and other areas of work, especially if when it is up and running, it could be expanded across the town because I've just given a brief update on the volunteer demographics. And throughout this, we've not seen any area where there's significantly more volunteers than another area. There is an age group of around 45 to 60 is, is the highest, but they have been anything from. 18 upwards we have had quite a lot of elderly people asking to volunteer and especially at the beginning when it was shielding and um, sometimes there's a bit of concern about that and we've actually had quite a few people who've had their vaccine and now want to be vaccine volunteers to help out so, so actually no that's not appropriate because you need to still be following the, the government guidance in terms of, of staying at home. And it's quite difficult to tell volunteers who really want to help out or give something back that some people still need to be really still shielding, still looking after themselves. Um, we the makeup of volunteers is been a massive mix. So it's um, people who've been furloughed, which actually I thought would have been higher than it was, but it was just 14 percent now. Um, but a lot of people maybe who are in sales, um, and some quite a lot of health professionals as well. Quite a few people are in IT as well. So it seems quite a few people who are working and now doing home working are sort of thinking, oh, I could probably just go and volunteer on a Wednesday afternoon and continue my home working in the evening. So they're, they're sort of making their lifestyles a bit more flexible to fit work and volunteering in. Um, Obviously, uh, once furlough ends at the end of April and when we come out of this, I think we all agree there's probably going to be a much higher number of people unemployed. So um, there will probably be an increase in people who are unemployed volunteering as well. But um, I think if we've really got some opportunities for them to engage and we can keep people engaged and support them to find uh, new new opportunities uh, in employment. Um, what we have had fed, fed back to us from the volunteers engaged is about doing this ad hoc volunteering, just helping out um, when they can. I mean, quite often we've just given a phone call or a text or whichever way they like being contacted to say, actually, could you just pop over to go and see Mrs Jones? She just lives around the corner from you just to see if she's OK. Or somebody needs some baby milk collecting who's self-isolating at the moment so they can't go out. Um, and people think people are quite happy to do that because it sort of takes them an hour out of the time. Um, and um, what we would like to see is just really keep encouraging these people to stay and be part of a bank of volunteering and just give them the opportunities and let them know about them when they arise. And that can be anything from obviously we're talking about food tonight, but it could be around the Rugby League World Cup, local local events that are happening, cultural events. So I think if something's come out of this COVID pandemic, it is about our community spirit and how people in Warrington have really sort of um, rise to the challenge doing engaged in our communities and volunteered, not just for WVA, but across the whole of the borough. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Any questions for Alison on uh, the work of WBA around the numbers of volunteers at the moment or the situation? Chair? Yes, Steve. Yeah, I tried to get in before, but I couldn't unmute. I just wanted to say thank you to Tracy as well for um, the report thank that she did. And uh, really interested about moving people on. And I'd like to have further conversations with her at some point, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Alison, I think um, it's, it's really, you know, it, there has been this upsurge in volunteer action, we've seen it, and, and we've, I, I know the volunteers that I've worked with, I think they're all signed up with once and volunteer action and doing great stuff. 
I think the the idea of the training I'm really interested in. Um, if you could let us have details of what sort of training packages are going to be available for volunteers, you know, um, and how we can get them onto them, that'd be great. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. I think that that's perhaps something that could be circulated to all the, uh, the committee members and, and even wider. Um, if we look at that, the, how how Warrington Voluntary Action are now providing training packages for volunteers, and certainly it, it's a, a big a big thing for a volunteer to get some training and and some way of moving on. It's a big encouragement into sticking with volunteering to help. I think. A, yeah, a, yeah. I think yeah. the training and Tracy was talking about from us was actually the training around the food pantry. Oh, yeah. um, but that might also apply to people again who are doing um, food share. Yeah, offers. definitely. Yeah, it, it, it might be a help, a help in, in that yeah. scenario. And uh, there are a lot of overlaps um, on the uh, the two offers, I think. Are there any more questions for Alison? Yeah, yeah. Can I, yes, I, I, I'm looking at um, maybe some bespoke packages as well for, you know, we're talking about trying to get them back into employment. And, yes. You know, so yeah. I, I don't know, but we might have a group of people who require a little bit of training in a certain thing and maybe that is that something that we could solve yeah definitely and we do do um something called make your volunteering count because sometimes i think people who do volunteer don't realize that they're actually quite they've got transferable skills there and sometimes i mean i've seen application forms and i think but you've been volunteering or oh, that was just my volunteering and actually you've developed all of these skills and it's about giving them that sort of I think we called it a volunteer passport at the time to say well you've got this you've done this and, and collecting everything together and helping them to build up the CV through yeah. a training package which is actually telling them what they're already doing in terms of the volunteering. That's that's very good yeah I think that's that's important um, they're, they're recognised for what yes. they do and there's so many validating yeah. that. And it, yeah, thank you. I think, I think it also addresses some of the things that we were saying earlier about um, people ad addressing the situation of how people get into the difficulties in the first place. Um, if we can work on the, the training um, and education and basically it needs to go further back than the age group probably of volunteers but it certainly is a step in the in the right direction to finding out how we can address some of the difficulties that uh, that people seem to have and maybe they're not aware of how they can get out of it okay anything else so we will move on and have the, the central six community forum update uh, from uh, Dave Appleton who is joining us on the phone so we won't be able to see him but he can talk us through his uh, the presentation from the Central Six Community Forum. Are you there Dave? Hi Jean, yes I am. Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, right, so we've got the slides. Do you look back Chris Witter? There we go, yeah. <laughs> We have our first slide on day. Right, so the community food provision. Yeah? Yeah. Right, so for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Dave Appleton. I'm on the Central Six Committee and we've been talking about uh, food poverty in Warrington now for a long, long time. Uh, am I echoing? Are we OK? No, you're OK. OK. Uh, and as well as that, I'm a store manager for the co-op uh, and I help to coordinate the food share in each of our 24 stores throughout the area. So I've got quite a little bit of knowledge on food share and the operations that we've got out there in the town. So second slide. So as we all probably aware in Warrington, there's different offerings that are available to us. The uh, one that we probably all know about is the Wellington Food Bank who goes under the Trussell Trust. We've had a great presentation from Tracer on the pantry. 
And then we've got fair share and food share. And I will go into more detail on the next slides about what them offerings are. And the end result is to obviously prevent food poverty, reduce food waste in that in the homes and the businesses, as well as tackling social isolation. I can say it, isolation and working together as a community and helping to sign both people as well, which has already been alluded to this evening to other services and support groups that are out there. So my next slide. Again, a little bit more about what is on offer throughout Warrington in a bit more detail. So we've got the food bank. Uh, we all know it's referral based and there's only so many times you can use it and you will pick, go in and pick up a bag that's already prepared and no choice of what you get in and taking it away with you. With the likes of the food share, it's predominantly fresh foods and uh, mainly veggies and bread and end of life. We also uh, help to tackle holiday hunger. Uh, a lot of that is around the school's holidays and uh, I know Jean's worked for many years on that in making up packed lunches for school children to ensure that every children gets fed whether the schools are in or not. And that happens around Warrington. Uh, and also in there, there's groups that were set up with COVID to help to support the elderly and the vulnerable and making up packs and to deliver that throughout the town. We've also got things like most of the food shares, it's not means tested, it's completely voluntary and it's relying on people's goodwill to come along and just take what they need to help to support the family in making a meal for that day. And the end result is we're helping with food poverty and we're also reducing food waste, which is helping the retailers, they're not having to put it in a bin, and also we're helping to the environmentals at the same time. So the next slide in a little bit more detail. So fair share, uh, Tracy did mention fair share and a lot of people might not fully understand how fair share works. Fair share in many ways is an umbrella for other groups. They receive stock from retailers, uh, from distribution networks, and it's predominantly bulk stock, which is uh, surplus to requirements. A lot of it chart data, but not all of that. Also, organisations such as the Co-op Group Fair Share. So recently, we committed to donating three million pounds uh, to help poverty, uh, through poverty, and we distributed that to Fair Share for them to distribute that on the co-ops we have to the community groups that are in Warrington and much further beyond and around the country. So people like the homeless shelter use this, community cafes, the pantry, luncheon clubs, any any group or organisation can ap apply to be part of Fair Share and get the benefits that are there. The next slide which is on food share. So food share, I've probably been working with since I first met Ames about three years, I think about three years ago now. And she'd set up her own little happy pub to help to feed the town and to stop food going to waste at the same time. So what is food share? It's predominantly excess junk dated and damaged stock from all the retailers that basically is not being sold at the end of the night. In how that works mainly, if if a food share group came into my store at the very end of the night, they can collect every little bit of stock we've got left. It's a bit of potluck what's going to be available. There could be abundance of one thing or a mixture of or nothing at all. It's really much what's not been sold and that can differ from retailer and store to store. It is predominantly produce and a lot of fresh bread, but you do get other bits and bobs at the same time. It's all free of charge to the 
community groups. It is encouraging the people to work together. It's helping the supermarkets by helping to promote and feed the the country. In I think the co-op announced that last year they do, through the food share they dono, donated five million meals through that. In with that, we've also got the different groups which we are. I think we've probably all heard of one or two of them, but. On counting, there's actually 20 different satellite groups throughout the town offering some sort of food share. The likes of Amy's Happy Hub, based in Orford and Latchford and uh, Fairfield. We've got Friends of Meadowside and Leave No One Behind. The good guys, we've got Latchford. They, so there's plenty out there. Next slide, that's just some statistics. Hopefully everyone can see them. Uh, it's estimates what we've worked off from the groups that have supplied us with information. Uh, and you can see there's some probably outstanding figures there of what actually available in terms of 14,000 meals a week. 180 collections, that's all of the supermarkets, some supermarkets. People may be collecting once or twice a day from them, going in the morning and then them of an evening. The reliance on 30 volunteer drivers. Obviously, they all need some money for some petrol and where does that actually come from? Uh, then we've got the volunteers, over 50 volunteers spread out across Warrington helping to deliver the food share. And we've got every supermarket supporting this throughout the town as well. So the last slide is what is mainly what would we like to happen? You know, there are there's a lot of groups out there doing some amazing things and they're all working away. And what you'll probably realise is they all like to stick to themselves and, and want to be supporting their community and very precious about it as well. So what we feel would work is if we could get each of the food shares under an umbrella uh, where they could just go to one site and they'll click in their postcode there where they live and see what group is closest to them and what days they're available. It'd be great if we could have a central point because at the moment we've got uh, volunteers collecting from each supermarket, we might even have two different groups collecting from the same supermarket, passing each other, and then they get back to their hub and what have they got? You could have one group in Sanke who's got nothing but potatoes and bananas, and in Fairfield they could have an abundance of fresh bread and cakes. And if we could get them all together and distribute it a little bit better, each of the groups would have a better choice of products which would help to make a meal for a family. So in, in that in summary really is we'd love it if we could get some support in providing uh, a support network in terms of premises because at the moment with Covid we've got people doing it from the gardens which isn't right, we need a premises room. We do need some refrigeration if, if, uh, to help to keep them products safe and secure. We all know, so need to work with the likes of the voluntary action people to make sure that these people have got food safety uh, in mind. And, and a wonderful probably as well, if we had a kite mark as well to say, yeah, these are recognised as carrying out every little bit of policy procedure that we're looking for and the part of the umbrella, which we go under whatever name we could think of. Uh, but basically, in summary, we are preventing food waste, the, each of the groups. Uh, they've all got the best intentions. They're all signposting people to other groups and the likes of the school swap shop and things like that can get involved. But I think we do need to support them in be, becoming more of a working together uh, for the for the good of the town to be successful and probably take it to the next level if that's the direction we're looking at. 
And that's it for me. If anyone's got any questions for me. Thank you, Dave. That was really interesting and informative. Uh, anybody got questions for Dave? Sharon. It's not, it's not a question. It's just to say thank you very much for all of that. Um, it's a really interesting report and for all the work that's being done. And I think that your idea of an umbrella um, would actually help in terms of people not duplicating the same um, activities and the same resources. So I think if, if you could move ahead on that somehow, I think that would be really beneficial. I don't know if the, if the Borough Council can help in any way in that respect. Maybe there's something we could look into going forward, you know. Yeah, can I speak if it's... Yes, yes, Councillor Wright. I know, I know the, 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 the food chair that I've sort of been involved with in where I am, uh, that comes under Happy Hub as sort of like the umbrella organisation. Mm. So whether that's not understood by other groups or, or whether those groups don't fall underneath that. Um, I, th I think the, 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 the point perhaps, uh, if we can come back to Dave on that, um, the umbrella is more of um, a loose term. Dave, can you yeah, it's, we, we still want each of the, well, I'd like each of the groups to still be independent and have their independence, but to work together and so uh, the, the community recognise one, one, one name or one Facebook site where they can go to be directed, but then from to, for each of the groups to work together in terms of an even distribution of the food, like I said, rather than people walking away with one product, walking away with a mixed bag. Does that clarify it for you, Steve, a little bit? Oh, no, I, I agree. I, I agree. I was, just, I was just saying that um, I thought that was like a, an umbrella organisation. That's all I was saying. I, I'm not, yeah, Happy, happy Hub is. Yeah, Happy Hub is, yeah. but going, I think we're looking at the next level from that where we've got uh, Happy Hub, Friends of Medicide, um, and uh, there's a couple of others. I can't remember all the names now, but they've they've all got several distribution points. But but each of them could have uh, their own surplus of something. Um, I know we had 15 boxes of bananas yesterday, which we could have you know shared and swapped about a bit, and maybe. Um, if, if people were working together more, so I think that's the the the, the idea of that umbrella, and also to have um, a signposting facility. If there was a you know a, a a joint Facebook website page, we may be able to use um, My Life Warrington or something that would tell people which food share was open when, whether it was Happy Hub or Friends of Medicide. But if you're really desperate for some food and the one you normally go to isn't open, um, you could have a look and see where there is another one that you might be able to use. That was, I think that's the idea behind that, behind that and that the, the groups work together more. Anybody got any comments on that? I think that's a really good idea because then it's you've not got all they're all over the place. But I do I, I have found though there's a bit of them. Um, oh, we're nothing to do with them. We're separate. We're you know, and it'd be nice if they could come together. But I don't know how you're going to work that because there's some strong personalities. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the uh, from the central six point of view. I'm sorry that I'm sort of path and we've got two hats on here but the um the 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 thought of having the standard of delivery that people could sign up to would be the start of building that umbrella yeah maybe yeah that would be yeah. a good thing as well yeah so that you could say this this group have been approved by the council as 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 agreeing to follow a certain set of rules 
um, and the, also the rules for the, that the supermarkets ask for as well. Sharon? No, I think that's that's oh, I think it's a really positive um, step forward and it, it gives sort of um, a bit of a guarantee in terms of safeguarding and all of those other issues that you you know you don't like to think about but you need to be aware of. Yeah. Sure. I, I know the, the group side that we want to involuntary action, don't they? As mm. a way of um, ensuring that the I know the ones I yeah. work with that are side that we want to involuntary action. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. um Councillor Wright, you you're right, a lot of them have signed up with um went to voluntary action. And I think the idea of having some sort of kite mark or quality assurance at, at some sort of level, so there's safeguarding, etc., um, or following certain standards is a really good idea. So completely different, but we've just spent six months doing one with um, the CCG and the local authority around mental health. So for those groups that support individuals um, that are doing peer support to have a kite mark. So I think it might be a good idea for, for food. Um, Chris, could I could I could I just mention something? Um, yeah. It's Chris Ginkis. Um I I I think it's essential, this, and I think it's a, you know it's a next step forward, and it's something that is required because I think it it provides a lot of um, it it provides a lot of reassurance to people who are in who are in receipt of the food that the that the quality of the food and the handling and the storage of the food is uh, you know um, consistent and is safe uh, and if that's reflected in Numberella organization if it's if it's consistent across a you know a number of groups that join a Numberella um, uh, that, you know that, that that's really important I think as well it would help to prevent a lot of the competitiveness between between groups in terms of um, you know their particular patch in their particular territory and I think David make a, made a really good point in his presentation about it creates that opportunity um, within that network at Umbrella to share and trade food so that you know, you know there's a better uh, even distribution of, of, of high quality produce. It, it maximises the, the volunteering opportunities and everything else and I think it, it will work really well. Uh, it, it's not something that, 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 that can be enforced, we can't make people you know um, join an umbrella and, and, and establish the same degree of um, uh, standards but I think that most of those groups uh, and I've spoken to one today actually would really would really welcome it and would you know as opposed to seeing it as a negative thing would really want to 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 see this as the next stage of their evolution and I would say that if it was something that was uh, the umbrella was something um, you know Alison might cringe when we saying this but I think if it was something that was um, of within the voluntary sector as opposed to within the council um, the, you know those groups would probably feel um, more likely to want to be involved and and, and more you know and, and have a, a trusted relationship with an organization like WVA and then obviously would have the, the support and the resources and the and some of the professional resources and support from from within the council as partners in that. So I think it's a natural evolution. I think it's it, you know it's the it's it's it really is the next step in terms of um, uh, unifying this and and and, and making sense and, and and working to our strengths. So I would really support that as as an outcome from tonight's meeting and in terms of a recommendation. I think it would it would be really helpful. Okay, is everybody in agreement with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Generally. Definitely. So, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, so, how do we move uh, forward on this then? So, do we make a recommendation from our committee that uh, we look into it, or do we ask Alison whether warranted voluntary action would be the um, time to do this? Chair, um, we've already been contacted by Cheshire Community Foundation to look into this because they were quite conscious of a number of things they were looking at, but um, they hadn't distributed as much money to a lot of the food groups in Warrington due to um, governance, a few other things, and actually getting those standards in place. So they'd contacted me probably about three or four weeks ago to sort of mull this idea over. So to hear you all saying actually that sort of thing 
is a good idea sort of fix everything together in cheshire west they have a food network and what happens is exactly as david had said would be a fantastic idea is i mean they're all meeting obviously virtually at the moment but have regular meetings and share their resources and like i'd said they'd said before there's too many bananas in one place somebody's got enough bread it's about sharing that they did say it probably took about a year to get everybody on the bus there was a few core um groups who came together but it took a while because as a few of you've alluded to is that some of them well that's that's our group we do this this is our food but actually understanding the bigger picture so that all of our residents who need food are getting food but yes so i can follow it up and, and i'll get back in touch with your chair about that about progress on that um, and a conversation that i've i've been having with Cheshire community foundation and actually chris as well so we could start to follow that up fantastic so we've got a a, a planned route for and we can report back to the scrutiny committee um that this is this is the plan that we recommend and that we need to include in that um, the the referral and the spotting of people who need help and how we get people out of the poverty trap um, so that they're not becoming dependent on these food food share off, off, off offers um, in the community. So I guess that we need to sort of discuss that side of it um as well uh, the, the, we've got the, the the recommendation for look making sure that the provision in the community is yes. at a reasonable standard but also the point that was brought earlier that people um how are they getting into this situation in the first place we haven't really addressed that one was that a Oh, your boss? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Are you waving to Tracy's mum, Chris? Are you? He's on mute still. Okay. Um. So everybody's gone very quiet now. So, um, what would be our feedback now then to the scrutiny committee? In Can I, um, yes, it's Councillor very Ryan. important that the, the groups don't feel that they're being done to, and I know that won't happen. Absolutely. And I do think that once involuntary action are best place to sort of ensure that. Um, it's about inviting them to to join in something that's positive. Yes, I think we can get yes. it right, and, and that, that that's the best way. Um, and ensuring that they understand that it's there to help them. Do better rather than yeah. take things away from them. Yes, that's, absolutely. That's I'd like to make sure that, that should be the angle that we come from, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I agree. and it is that is indeed what we want to do. We don't want to be telling anybody they shouldn't be doing anything or um, stopping people from doing something. We want to help them to do what they do even better than they're doing already and keep themselves and everybody else. I used to have a phrase when I was the mayor chair. I used to go around and I say to people, you can't keep saying, telling communities they should be doing stuff and then follow up by saying, but not that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we need to recognise the good and we need to build on it and yeah. share it as best we can. Yeah. And I think Dave is brilliant presentation. So thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Big, big thank you to Dave for that one. He's a uh, very good. Um, ambassador to the community from the uh, the retail shops okay so are we all happy with progress on that yes we yeah yeah okay yeah. so we know, what, we know what we're doing yes, thank you so we'll move on to the um, work program for 2021 um we may have one more meeting um before the uh, election if it does in fact take place in may which is at the moment they're saying it will but we have a meeting scheduled for the 21st of april and on our work program 
uh, we were looking to add the updating changes and procedures regarding prosecution of fly tipping tippers and um, these Central Six Community Forum project relating to small green spaces uh, and community uh, parks, pocket parks, and how the Parks and Woodlands team could help with the development and sustainability of those. So um, those two items uh, we are looking at putting on the agenda for April, for our April discussions. Is that OK with everybody? Yes. Yeah. Oh, silence yeah, yeah. is accepted as yes. OK, so uh, the next thing on our our agenda is the schedule of meetings. Sorry. Excuse me, Chair. Sorry, it's Abigail, the clerk yes. of the committee. Um, I think we still have one update to do, which is from Anne-Marie Carr. Just the update of what other authorities are doing and how Warrington compares. Oh, I do apologise. Yes. No. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I do apologise. Go back to we have to go back to Anne-Marie's update of what other authorities are doing and how we compare to them. I do apologise, Anne-Marie, please, can you give us that update? OK, so there, I've got a very short presentation. Um, so I work for public health, so I've got a real interest in how food um, and the food we eat, how it impacts on our health. And that's both our psychological and emotional well-being as well as our physical health. But it's particularly important at the minute that people are staying physically healthy as a protection against COVID. And if they do contract COVID, in the, they're in the best place to recover from COVID as well. So this is all the more important for, for us in public health at the minute. So I've had a chat with people um, on some national webinars and I've spoken to a few colleagues um, in the cross the northwest as well. And so the information I'm bringing to this meeting, I'm really happy to say agrees with and supports everything that's been discussed so far. So that's a really positive, really, really positive start to this. It may be useful, useful for us to look at the issue um, by looking at two different terminologies. So if we look at food poverty, that's where households don't have enough income to buy food, um, adequate food for the household. And that can be when people have lost jobs or somebody's died suddenly, or there's been um, a problem with benefits coming into the home, for example. Food insecurity is a different issue. Food, in, food insecurity is where um, cooking, planning and making meals for the household is not a priority for that house. So that can be for many different reasons. Um, it can be when people are juggling uh, creditors, for example. It's also part of a culture that's built over the last few years where many households eat the majority of their meals outside of the home. So they eat outside of the home, either from bakeries, from quick grab things that they get from the supermarket or from fast food outlets as well. Now, that's not to blame people for making those decisions. That's the way that we've created um, the community around them a lot of the time. So a lot of the time it's really difficult for them to buy fresh foods. But it's really easy for them to walk out and buy something cheap off a fast food uh, shop in the, in the high street there. So we need to think about how we're supporting people both in the short term to get out of that food poverty, but also those medium and long term things that we can support people to think differently around how they um, view food and how they bring food into the house and prepare it for themselves and, and other members of their family. But certainly both food poverty and food insecurity have some really long term impacts on family and are a really big part of the health inequalities that we see across the town as well. So we go to the next slide. Um, this has been mentioned already, but there is a, a framework that is used across the country, but particularly in London boroughs, and it's called a um, it's called the food ladders framework. And that's where we look at short, medium and long term um, solutions and strategies to this issue. So we look at the short term strategies It is what's just been discussed there. It's around having a more coordinated and collaborative effort in the town. So what other local authorities have created are called food alliances. Now, the best practice for a food alliance would that it be chaired and coordinated by somebody outside of the local authority. So somebody who could be seen as a trusted source for all those different third sector organisations that have popped up. Quite often isn't going to be somebody from the council. It's going to be somebody who's already in the third sector. So that's just exactly what you've just been talking about. But that cross-referencing um, gives us the best coverage in the town. So not only does it mean that we're maximising the resources in terms of donated food and volunteer time, it also means we can keep an eye on 
who is getting donation, uh, sorry, who's getting free food from where so we can support those families in the best way. So we want to move them on. We want to give them food parcels um, and emergency food parcels for a short period and then get them onto the next step of that ladder. If they've been able to just like ping pong between different um, charities getting food for a long period of time, we're not supporting that household the best way we can. Um, part of having that food alliance is already as discussed. We'd have a minimum standard that we'd like people to um, have within those packages. Part of that should always be items that they can prepare a meal. So not just something fast that they can just eat out of a packet, but something about what they're thinking about putting a meal together. That's a really important part of it. And the other thing that we'd like to see is that with all food that goes out, it, com it comes along with lots of other information of what's available in the town. So certainly debt advice, credit union advice, um, where people can get mental health support, family support as well. So it'd be great if every food package, no matter where it came from, had the same standardised information going out. That would be another part of the coordination we'd be looking at. Then if I go on to the next slide, the medium term strategies. This would very much building upon the food pantry idea. So um, talking to colleagues in Manchester, there's a charity there called Healthy Me, Healthy Communities, and they run a, um, a community grocer um, project which is very similar to our food pantry project. You pay £2.50 to get £12 worth of food. And they use all the same principles as, as we do in Warrington. It's just that it's at a much larger scale. So each neighbourhood, each community centre would have a grocer project and it's staffed by a very large number of peer supporters. So those volunteers are from people in that area. So the rules are you have to be 15 minutes walk away from that community centre to benefit from the grocer project or to volunteer in that grocer project. So it is that very much people feel fit. Um, they can talk about the issues that they're experiencing to somebody who's from that area. So that building trust is a really big part of that. They've also managed to expand on that project by having um, group cooking and eating sessions. So that social connection part of it is when we start seeing how people can build resilience for themselves by their building their confidence by being in contact with more people in the same situation as they are and then they can share solutions and share ways that they've moved on in their lives as well so that social element is a really big element of it um, the other element um, that, that they have that we've had in Warrington previous as well is helping people plan and shop so if you been, if you live in an area where your only shopping um, option is maybe one of those small supermarkets that has a really restricted, very restricted number of food items you can buy from, going to a big supermarket can be very overwhelming and it can make people really anxious. So help, holding people's hands and taking them to a big supermarket and helping them see what they could get for their available budget is a big part of this and it's just again adding to those skills. So if you look at the next slide, this is just a few of the outcomes that we've got from that Manchester project. Um, and it just shows you that I think it's 89% of the people who attend that say that their health and well-being has improved since they were a member of that community project. And over 90% of them as well know more people than they used to know in their local area after being part of that project. So it, it's everything we've talked about, but just building on it and just resourcing it all the better. There we are, there we've got, got the, um, there we go, 96% of people who take part in it think they know more people. So it's just really building on that community cohesion and those community strengths that we know is part of the problem when people feel isolated at home, then, you know, that's really poor for their mental health and they start making, um, you know, worse decisions for themselves as well. I know we haven't got much time left, so if we move on to the last slide, when we start looking at long term solutions, this is then we take um, a lot of responsibility away from um, the community then, and this is then back to us as council officers on what we're doing to create an environment where people have better choices. It's easy for them to make better choices for themselves. A lot of what we want to plan for the long term strategies are actually included in that um, central six master plan actions that we've got. So creating more jobs, and creating more jobs that work in synergy with the benefit system. So universal credit was brought in to make sure that people who are at work are always better off than people who are on benefits. 
but you have to think about how many hours that works for, how many hours people can work for while caring for, for children maybe, while that, so that universal credit works. So we need to think a little bit more around that. Um, we need to think more around job skills. So when big industries um, and big organisations come into the town, those having an agreement of how many local people they will take. And we ensure that those local, local people have the right skills to get, get into those jobs. There's something about um, good quality, affordable housing that is centred around a dining area, a good kitchen and a good dining area. So people move into those homes and it's centre of the home that they believe that they're going to sit around the table as a family and eat meals together. That is something that not all modern houses and a lot of what we're building in the town isn't focused around that. So we need to have to think about that. The way we plan where supermarkets are, the way we plan where um, hot food takeaways are allowed to open, it's just a lot of that infrastructure stuff. Again, like I say, it's not so much the community work now, this is for stuff for people in the council to think of. And lastly, it is an adoption of that strength based approach. So any kind of service within the council should have the same approach where we're helping people make better decisions for themselves. We're not telling people what they should and shouldn't do. We're giving them better opportunities to make better opportunities, uh, better choices for themselves. And that takes time. So we're not talking about short term investments or short term projects. We're talking about 10, 15, 20 years of the same policies and same projects in place. That's the only thing that's going to make the difference really to our communities. Sorry, I've rushed that because we've run out of time, but if there's any questions of anyone. Chair, for the comment. Of course, yes. Thank you. I think uh, I get all that. I think I think the service that we're doing, the sort of stuff we're doing now in, in our communities is shaped by COVID and its restrictions. And so we have tailored the support to fit as best we can the need that's out there with the resource that we've got and, and the and a lot of time the inavailability, if that's the right word, of 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 I mean we the community centres are as accessible, if accessible at all. So some of the other work, the other relationships, the other engagement is more difficult to, to happen. But I think what has happened is that people have stepped up in unprecedented circumstances and done their best to help with the community. So that's got to be lauded and appreciated. I think you've also so that, that that goes without saying that we, we know what's happened and we know that in in a in a, when we get out of this in a better world we'll be trying to do things in a better way different way and work together and all those great ideas that we've had we've just touched on the the the, the fact what is the escape route because if people are not getting paid enough if people are worried about the jobs all the time if they've not got uh, the, the housing that we're talk, talking about where they can gather around a table. Some of the houses that, that I work with people, they've got one room and a, a kitchen and a couple of rooms and, and they're trying to homeschool children at home and they haven't got the space, there's no there's no privacy. They're not all living in big houses with separate places that they can all do the different, different things. So there's the underlying issues that are affecting lots of people you know, you talked about the universal credit, how that helps people to be better off if they're in work and stuff. But we've got to get to a stage where somehow that people who find themselves in these situations can see a way out. And it's very difficult at the moment for a lot of people to see the way out. And, and so at least if they are getting a bit of contact from regular volunteers, people going and saying hello and giving a bit of food and doing what they can, that in many ways that's the, the best we can expect at the moment we're all being told now to stay in only go out if it's absolutely necessary stay you know it's, it's a dangerous situation we're in so that's all i'm saying i think it's great report and i think the, the circumstances are dictated by the, the conditions that we're in and we need to the government or whoever people the, the clever people need to be planning proper escape routes for people that, that doesn't leave them in despair and doesn't drive them further into doing things that perhaps they wouldn't have done if they had a better frame of mind and so it's not easy out there for some people so these are great ideas and we 
we, we, we want to move on with it, but we've got to try and get that, that baseline right where people are not in such a situation that they can't see a way out. So that's it really. Thank you. Thank you. And say so, thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, do apologise for almost missing you, but I'm really glad that we didn't. It was a fascinating report, really, really good. And I think um, it throws up so many uh, things that this this committee could bring on to their work programme going forward. There's a lot of opportunities there to, to discuss um, di different ideas from, you know, the, the way we have our houses uh, built, um, how we can influence the designers and the developers uh, to, you know, influencing what people eat on a day to day basis. So uh, thank you very much for that. Does anybody else wish to comment on our question, Anne-Marie? OK, everybody. Happy? Yes, Chair, I don't think I've got those slides. Are we getting those? Yeah, I was going, those yes. Please, yeah. if you could have Anne-Marie's slides circulated, Abigail, that would be much Thanks, appreciated. Chair, yeah. Thank no you. Problem. I'll get them circulated um, after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we've covered the work programme uh, thing because I got myself in a muddle. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled for the 21st of April, but hopefully in between times we'll have some updates because we will make some progress with Warrington Voluntary Action uh, on our on the on the food share um, objectives. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. Everybody happy? Yes. Yeah. 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 So at this point, I will say enjoy the rest of your evening, and we would normally say have a safe journey home, but Hopefully, you're not going too far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.